Okay, it's 6.02 and the Conservation Commission meeting will come to order. The first order of business is the approval of the minutes from last month. Has everyone had a chance to look them over? I have a couple things, a few things. Um, 3A, the second bullet, a new packet reflecting the changes for their appearance. I'll just change that from for their appearance to, to the plan. Um, B, the um, Third sentence, uh, well actually, I was confused about the second sentence. Um, code compliance has two sets of history. Do you remember what that means? Yeah, so when we were discussing this at the last meeting, um, <clears throat> there were two sets of histories that Dana had referenced and going back through um, the court order. Uh, looked like they were broken up by time. One was the 2011 set one was the 2022 set so just noting that there was a break in the time span there could we kind of could we call that out sure. instead of just saying two sets of history thank you then um where it says there are court orders Let me know when you find that sentence. Uh, I would just strike there are and change uh, court to, to be the first word um, and strike that. So it says court orders were issued in 2011 and 2022. Sure. And then I would replace the following sentence where it says our purview here is unauthorized wetlands actions to say uh, the commission is to review the mitigation plan. And just a couple typos uh, under new business um, a new correspondence uh, draft solar ordinance there's an I missing between the D and the N and the same thing under B the first iteration of the word ordinance uh, and one more um, when you're ready. Go ahead. So under E, um, the last paragraph, the last sentence, S. R. Zukowski will check on the list of easements requiring monitoring. I'll just change monitoring to signage. Other comments or no. changes? Is there a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Yeah, you caught up? Yeah. Okay. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second to approve the minutes as amended. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion passes. Next order of business is public comment. Is there anyone, anyone from the public who would like to speak? Okay. Next is um, item three, conditional use permit requests. A, Packy's Investment LLC is seeking a conditional use permit to, I'm sorry, for 100 square feet of impact for proposed storage building 
2,860 square feet impact for flight grading slash stormwater management and 21,490 square feet impact for tree clearing and solar array construction within the riparian and wetland buffer as part of a commercial development on property located at 363 Route 108 in the Commercial Industrial District Assessor's Map 48. Lot 22 B CUP 14 2022. Mr. Stoll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board members Bob Stoll at Tritech Engineering representing the applicant and owner this evening. Mr. Campbell was not able to be with us this evening. Um, I'd like to, to uh, walk through what we've done since the last time we were here. One thing I noticed when I was getting ready to, to do the put the board up to tonight was that the plan that you have is missing one of his his solar trackers. Thank you. Which one was it? This one right here. Okay. So the plan, the plan that you've got, uh, we were at the uh, uh, the planning board uh, in January of, of this year. Planning board had asked that we we come back and and uh, try and work with the commission a little further, see if we could get a plan that that was uh, satisfactory to the commission. Uh, so we have made some some revisions. We are down to to ten of of the solar trackers that Mr. Campbell lost in installed. We started off with twelve. We're currently at 10 of the, the solar trackers, um, and now the, the plan you have in front of them does show all, all 10 of those. Um, and and we, we, we've, uh, the plan here is identified a little bit better. Again, I think, think where we, we got off track a little bit before was with the, the tree cutting, um, and we've tried to identify that better on here. We've got approximately 21,500 square feet of area that that wasn't necessary for the construction of the of the storage or the installation of the trackers. It was it was tree cutting um, for access to the sunlight to have the, the the solar trackers function properly. And so we've got that identified on the plan, and we and we've we've identified the the plan to uh, to deal with that as far as. We'd like to plant that with uh, a, a conservation seed mix, and uh, uh, just mow that as as needed to make sure it doesn't interfere with with sunlight reaching the the solar trackers. Uh, but I did want to talk about about the tree cutting for a moment. I know the last time we were here, um, there was I think there was uh, miscommunication or or I didn't have enough information for the board at the time about the, the tree cutting. As, as we've talked about, um, I think at the, lo the last meeting, the, the tree cutting has been done. Uh, Mr. Campbell thought he was, was able to do that under the, the timber harvest ordinance or regulations. So he, he went ahead and did the, the, the tree cutting. We were here on, on uh, November 9th, and the, and the board expressed that the, that, uh, that wasn't their interpretation, and subsequently uh, the, the planning director also issued a uh, an opinion of, of the ordinance that said that that wasn't appropriate for her for a couple of different reasons. Um, but when we were here in December, I wasn't sure when the tree cutting had taken place, and it had actually taken place before that n November 9th meeting. Um, so we, again, I think there was a feeling from the board that that uh, Mr. Campbell had heard your objections and cut trees anyways, and he did just want to clarify that that. Uh, Again, through his interpretation of regulations, he thought he could cut them, and he cut them before um, it was brought to light uh, that that was that wasn't appropriate. He understands that now, and that's why it's part of our conditional use application. Um, so that that's where we're at. We've got we've got the the uh, again the replanting of the of the disturbed area with with a conservation seed mix to allow it to to turn into a meadow type environment 
that is uh, that's positive for our stormwater runoff. It's it's positive for a, a wildlife transition from from the development to the to the uh, to the mature forest that abuts it. And um, you know I think those are the, the the key points that we wanted to, to talk about. But certainly be happy to answer questions that the the board has. Thank you. So um, there was some change in the configuration of the placement of, of the arrays from the last plan that we heard. So yes, that, that we did. We pulled, the, again, the, the last plan had some of them with the actual trackers within the, the buffer as well, and we pulled, pulled those out so that they were, they are in, uh, there's one of them that's in the, uh, the buffer, but it's in the area that's disturbed for the, the detention pond anyway. So we, we took them out of the, 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 the area that's just for the sunlight. And so the applicant had cut the trees at that at that time uh, with the intent of the original plan that had the trackers placed closer to the wetland. Now that they're not the plan is to move them back, um, is it feasible to uh, to reforest any part of what what has been cut um, and still? get clearance for the, the trackers? You know, that that's something that, that we that we talked about. We looked at different options as far as, as, as revegetation. Um, and, and again I think the concern over time is is that that real trees grow real tall and, and that doesn't that doesn't uh, doesn't uh, fit well with the, the, the solar trackers. Um, you know we did look at maybe some other options of low lying shrubs or that type of thing that would provide uh, some ground cover and at the end of the day we came back that the, the, the meadow, the conservation seed mix was going to provide uh, uh, very similar characteristics on, on the drainage and, and for wildlife characteristics. So we, that's where we landed with, with the, uh, the, the meadow. As far as, far as is, is there a certain amount, I, I, I don't know if there's a certain area that could be, be trees that uh, is uh, has been disturbed that's slated for conservation mix. Can you um, just briefly like address how you're going to establish that meadow? Those are somewhat difficult to get going. Yeah, it, it, it's um, again, it's an area that, that uh, the land hasn't been disturbed, uh, the surface mm -hmm. configuration, it, it, it hasn't been stumped, ha hasn't been uh, uh, excavated, so that the, the uh, Working with the landscape architect, she's she's come up with a list of, of preparation techniques that we should use to, to get it ready to, to mix, and uh, 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 ready to place the mix. So, so we we we, ha we have worked with the, the landscape architect on that. Yeah. So disturbing. So there there'd potentially be a lot of disturbance in the site to establish that meadow. Then, um, again, the idea would be to keep it as as natural as as, as possible. That that. Um, Again, to in order to uh, the concern with was just leaving it as is is that we'd get a lot <coughs> of competing growth that would that would uh, um, compete with with again growing the, the the meadow. So I think his he contemplated the uh, the stumps that are there as opposed to excavating those to grind those uh, to again keep as little disturbance as possible on on that. I guess you know one thing that worries me is that you know this is just sort of a, a give me to us in the in sense in the sense that it is hard to establish those and so um, it could be very easy to go to the site and just spread out seed and say that you've established a meadow and so if there's not you know sequential steps taken to establish that then you're going to seed an area and it's just going to come back as probably red maple or something you know and so kind of understanding the establishment of that meadow and then any any type of uh, management going forward would be helpful. Uh, I would add to that uh, more likely Japanese knotweed than maple. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so we, again we 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 did consult with the the landscape arch architect as well as uh, Damon Burt the the wetland scientist did the wetlands mapping. And both of them had had good input on on the pro process, and and uh, certainly if if we need to to incorporate that detail, 
to, to, to vet that out certainly we could we can go that next step well I agree with Kevin's concerns um, about the difficulty of establishing a meadow and not it's not going to happen on its own so even if you plant grass seed um, it you know it, it wouldn't be a hands-off project mm -hmm. um, putting that aside a meadow in that area doesn't compete with me uh, for a, a forest um, as far as flood storage and um, and the you know the original habitat um, transitioning to the the wetlands that's my that's my take yeah again we, we have we haven't proposed any any uh, again uh, from here, if we did the stump grinding, uh, still no proposed to the, the topography that would interfere with, with the flood storage. And, and uh, although it would be uh, uh, a, a different type of, of wildlife habitat, I think it'd be a valuable uh, habitat abutting the, again, when we transition to the wet, it, it's, it's, not, it's not open water. It, it's a wooded, wooded wetland that, that uh, I think this would act as a suitable transition to that. For, for different types of wildlife that, uh, again, aren't necessarily aren't suited to the mature forest. How does the new solar ordinance impact this? I know, the, I know it's draft at this point, but I know it's pretty much clearly stated that there wasn't going to be any solar within any buffer zones. Are, are we still? That, that was our this position on it, but I, I, it's not in place yet. Okay. Bob, could you repeat, are you, are you saying you want to stump grind? Yes, yes. But no. if you stump grind, then you're gonna um, not, you're gonna destabilize the soil that's there. No, it's gonna be followed up by the, by the planting. So it, it, it's, it's not, not in a vacuum. But you're hoping if the planting takes, but if the planting doesn't take, you're destabilizing it. Plus your own, um, your own environmental engineer from Fraggle Rock recommended that um, during the tree clearing within the 100 foot riparian and wetland buffer, all shrubs and herbaceous cover be maintained, that impact to existing ground be minimalized to, um, minimized to the greatest extent possible, and that shrub and open field habitat will provide adequate sunlight for solar trackers as well as providing potential habitat to wildlife species such as songbirds, insects, rabbits, and turtle species. I don't think a grassy meadow is gonna do that. Um, additional impacts to soil and or site grade shall be avoided during tree clearing. Um, one of the other things that was recommended that it would be done at times of either dryness or frozen ground, and if it was done on before November 9th of last year, it wasn't either of those things. So I still have a lot of problems with this whole process and this whole um, thing that he wants to do. Because I think, I think there's been a lot of things done that shouldn't have been done and they may or may not have been as ignorant as what is stated. Um, just from my own point of view. Mm -hmm. But I, again, I, I think the, the applicant has indicated the, 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 the chain of events of, of how he got there. He, he's a uh, see, seasoned, seasoned developer, uh, just not necessarily in summer's worth, not necessarily familiar with some of the regulations. Um, and he's laid out the timeline on, on what he did and, and the, the, uh, the good faith intent that he had when he did it. I, I, I think we've got to take him at his word that, that uh, that's 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 what it, what it was. Not that it changes this conversation, but I would I would argue that he's very familiar with the Summersworth regulations, mm -hmm. and he's come before this commission a couple times. Uh, once for solar trackers at a different location. And it, and again, it didn't didn't uh, it w it was uh, a solar tracker and a buffer that, but it, it it was already a cleared site that didn't have the the, the tree the tree. I just issue. wanted to point that out yeah. for the record. Okay. Um, as, as far as uh, Damon's uh, report, that was that was uh, published prior to uh, seeing what the current conditions are. That, that again, it was it was uh, very mature forest. That when the trees were cut, 
there, there, is, there is no underlying um, shrubbery or, or, or growth that's there. It was, it was big trees that were cut down, and now you, you've, got, you've got something that's got to take its place. And if we just let it, uh, that was the original plan, was, was to, to, to let the, the undergrowth come back. Um, but again, seeing how it looked once it was cut, the, his, his report was no, no longer applicable. So we've worked on trying to come up with an, uh, an alternate plan that will, will suit the site better. A few points that I'd make here. Your client has been before both the Conservation Commission and Planning Board several times in the past uh, for projects other than this in Summersworth. So his indication that he's not familiar with the regulations here is somewhat disingenuous. As, as to his... Um, your statement that we should take him at his good faith. I will not make comment on that. I will let the record of his appearances before those two boards speak for me. I would note here that the uh, environmental scientist who did, um, <coughs> your wetland scientist rather, who did the uh, previous application, although that, that assessment did refer to the prior original conditions on the site, there is one important piece in here that can't be understated. Shrub and open field habitat will provide adequate sunlight for solar trackers. So your applicant's statement that the emplacement of shrubs lower lying vegetation beyond grass seed projection could have potential interference with his intended operations on the site, he is in disagreement with his own hired expert. That to me states that when we're dealing with the opinion of a developer and the opinion of a wetland scientist, I'm going to go with the wetland scientist, and I think, frankly, your client should as well. Your client has suggested here repopulating this area with a seed mix in placement of an established mature forest, which he removed likely or should have known in a non-permitted way. You are not replacing like with like. There's an argument to be made that replacing like with like here would be too much to ask. You can't really replace a mature forest when it's been destroyed. However, your client did destroy that mature forest. So our request that he replace this with something as close to what he destroyed is not only reasonable, it's charitable. I think we've been very clear about what we're looking for here replacement with as close to the original conditions as can be reasonably accomplished. Projection of a seed mix does not accomplish that in any way, shape, or form. I will not vote to recommend approval for this in its current state. If he takes us to the planning board, I will not vote in approval of it there, and I will attempt to rally the rest of the board to deny it as well. I would advise you to go back to your client, work with him to develop a more comprehensive, more complete plan that comes closer to what he has destroyed, whether through ignorance or malice. I don't ascribe either to him. The conditions on the field are a removed mature forest that needs to be replaced with something as close to that as it can be done. This does not meet that standard by any way, shape, or form. I, I would um, say before going back to the applicant um, about changing the plan um, for any sort of restoration. Um, the commission should decide on the placement of the trackers themselves um, because um, it, I, I would see it as, as a moot point if the commission decided that the placement of the trackers was too close to the to the wetlands, or uh, encroached too much on the buffers. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. so what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'd like to see it outside of the buffer entirely, especially considering the new draft ordinance coming up. Mr. Breyer, any thoughts on that? Sorry? Okay.
You know, one of the things that you have stated is that you can't allow trees to grow up because they're going to block the light. Well, I don't think that something on the north side of a solar tractor that's primarily fa facing south, east, and west is going to impact that tractor too greatly. So, for example, all that area to the north of that far left one, why can't that be regrown um, or replaced? And, and just look at it more openly instead of just a specific flat, no vegetation kind of place, which is what it seems like he wants, um, except for the, the meadow that you've already heard the opinion on that. So um, Understood. that's just another one of my thoughts is that it didn't make any sense to me to be concerned about something on the north side of, a, of the tracker that's not going to impact the light all that much. A point of reference on that, um, the October plan I have here is um, shows one tracker that's that looks to be about maybe t 15 or 20 feet from the wetland itself. Um, and I assume it's wooded there where the wetland begins. It, it is. So that's, you know, 15 feet from there as opposed to. Um, I don't know, 50, 40 or 50 feet from what's on the most recent plan. So with that logic, you know, you could argue that at least some of what has been cut could be restored um, with the placement as, as shown on the current plan. Can I add to that a little? Mm -hmm. um, I was just, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just thinking if you replanted the trees, <clears throat> excuse me, especially on south, I'm not sure which side that is now, which side east, I guess it would be the east side of the property, and let them grow. They're going to have to get to a certain height before they block the sun. At that point, maybe put some stipulation in that he has to maintain a certain tree height. And if you don't get sun at 8 o'clock in the morning, but you do get it at 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the evening, that should be plenty of, of sunlight to generate electricity. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to regulate. Um, I think we'd have to pick species of, of vegetation that would, would limit as, a, as opposed to that figuring how to cut them at a certain time. Right. That or annually do a trimming or every other year. Plus, the, the solar arrays don't have an indefinite lifespan. Um, and depending on the rate of growth of certain species, it's not really going to, it's going to be a long time before they're impacted because they're probably going to need to be replaced before the tree reaches mature height. Again, I think depending upon the, the species that were, were chosen, that, that, could, that could be true. One final point to raise. Um, the chairman did refer back to a prior plan, the original October one which had one, at least one tracker fully emplaced inside the buffer and within 15, I believe, feet, you said it was, of um, established tree line. Do you know if it was your client's intent to cut all timber in that space originally? I, I do not, do not know. My point here is that he has an original contention that this was a timber harvest. If he had intended to do that, Clearly, he did not intend it to be strictly a timber harvest. It was in place for construction. You may wish to discuss that with him. Well, I think we've covered that with the um, administrative appeal. Um, I think that's been established. Mr. Stoll raised comments about his uh, client working in good faith. I think that's worth mentioning. So. I'm 
wondering how, how to approach this in terms of uh, a vote. Um, I hesitate to send you back to the client if you know I, I don't want to string you along or string him along and say you know let's let's get a more detailed plan on how you you intend to establish a meadow there if if what the commission is thinking is we don't want a meadow anyway um, and if there's not if the reason that we don't want a meadow is that we want it to be reforested then are we saying completely reforested or some percentage thereof or that we're just going to deny or vote to deny this uh, proposal altogether. I think those are th those are three possibilities. And when you say reforest it, you're you would like to see the entire the entire disturbed area reforested, the green and the purple on here. I I would, but yeah. I, I wouldn't force that on the rest of the commission. I mean, my concern is that once you remove the overstory like that, you know, I'm just thinking of it from a pragmatic way. It's like, you know, what's going to be easier and what is a, the, the landowner more likely to do to m maintain like a usable, ecologically usable habitat, you mm -hmm. know? Are they going to go in and plant trees and take care of those trees? Or is maybe like blueberry or something like that, you know, a better approach where we know we get vegetation on the site, um, or is the meadow better? I, I'm not sure. I just, I, I worry that certainly establishing or planting that area with trees may be not followed up on. And it would be a higher overhead for, for trees than blueberries, mm -hmm. for example. Um, what, what uh, other alternatives would there be for plants? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know offhand what would be the best thing to go in there, but we could you know we could look into that. the The meadow, you know, it would be hard to maintain too, and so I think there's this place in between meadow and forest, <laughs> kind of successionally that would be maybe the sweet spot um, where it wouldn't it would have to be. There'd be work to, to get it established, but I think after that it would be relatively not, not maintenance free, but it would be easier to, to care for. Providing wildlife habitat, maintaining soil integrity, all of that. Um, I just I don't see a forest going back in there and being taken care of and and and, and meeting like those ecological requirements we would hope for. Yeah. As far as um uh habitat I would think that there are probably some a good number of oaks that were cut white red maybe I don't know but um that's good food for for wildlife and that blueberries might be some sort of for, for different species replacement yeah. for food but and maybe it's a combination you know of planting you know, replanting trees on some portion of that where, you know, it seems like they would do the best and become, or have the, you know, have the best sort of micro environment to, to, to make it without a lot of care. Yeah, thinking about all the huckleberries in my, in my yard and how they just spread on their own. Mm -hmm. um, they're relatively dense. That's probably, uh, I agree, that's probably a pragmatic solution and that we may not get back to the, uh, the initial condition. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that we ended up here and now it's, you know, it's trying to make something out of a wasteland, I think, that, we, that will be a wasteland if it's not maintained and managed for at least a couple years. Um, In that case, uh, you know, if we were to go with an option like that, we would have to go back to the landscape architect, maybe. Yeah, 
I think so. That come back? Yep. I mean, I would I assume they'd have considered that, or at least been an option that's been discussed. Again, we, we, we talked about the, um, the reforesting option, and, and uh, honestly, the client was more concerned about the impact on, on the light uh, than yeah, the, clearly. The, 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 yes, uh, rather than the, the uh, ability to, to achieve it. Uh, we did talk about some un, uh, lower lying shrubberies like the blueberries, mm -hmm. and, and uh, again, at the end of the day, we, we, we thought the, the, the meadow had a similar effect on, again, wildlife and, and storm runoff w without, we, we, we felt that that was going to be easier to do than, than the, the, the shrubbery. Um, if that's, if that's, if we're off track on that and the board has a, has a different thought on it, uh, again, we, we, we've discussed it with the landscape architect with, with, with Damon Burt. Uh, we had a forester that worked with us on some ideas. Uh, we can get the team back together and, and, and try and come up, try and come up with something. Yeah, I think that'd be more than fair, given how we got here. Would one month be sufficient time for that to happen, or would the, your client need more than that? Yeah, you know, we, we, we've 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 already floated some of the ideas, uh, so I, I would I would I would think if if we can get if we can get the client on board. Uh, there wouldn't be anything holding us back from getting back here. Okay. That, that's, a, that's a big if. Sure. All right, Mr. Dodds, would you be interested in formulating that into a motion? Uh, I haven't really done that before. Um, all right, so do I, can I do it as just like a request? We are requesting... Um, Yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I'm just not sure how you word I, how it should be worded. I think you were going to say something. Uh, you're looking to continue the application to the September. Nice. Give me one second. September 13th meeting, and requesting that the applicant return with a landscape plan um, showing shrubbery, um, considering shrubs and other plantings that would be more substantial than the meadow. Providing food. That would provide for habitat and food. Yeah. Is that Nicely we're put, Kevin. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make motions. <laughs> So is that a motion? It sounded like one. Is that a motion? <laughs> I would second that. It is a motion. Okay, there's a, there's a motion. I'll second it. <laughs> Thank there's you, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Rose, do you have all the? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we'll vote by roll call. Mr. Breyer? Yep. Mr. Rhodes? Yes. Ms. Smith Kenyon? Yes. Mr. Degler? Yes. Mr. Dodds? Yes. And I vote yes. So the motion carries. Great. Th thank you. See you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next uh, item is the Conditional use uh, permit application. Get my stuff in front of me here. Michael Davis is seeking a conditional use permit for after the fact excavation and alter alterations within the riparian and wetland buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road in the residential single family district assessor's map 31, lot 49, CUP 03 2023. And the uh, applicant has requested a continuance. Is that correct? Uh, he had indicated that he was going to be here. 
Um, I have not received any communication for continuance, but it does not appear that he's here tonight. I thought someone emailed me that. He, it could be communication that I'm just not on. Well, let me check. Maybe it was a phone call with Anna. If he, he could have called after I, between yeah. uh, 4 30 and this meeting. Um, oh, last I, he had reached out saying he was going to come, though he was not prepared with the items that we had asked him to provide, um, but he's not here. Okay, so there's not much we can do anyway. Um, no. Nope. Continue. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have a motion? I'll make a motion to continue till next month. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Motion. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries to continue. All right, new business. Item A, Kelly Barstow on behalf of Favorite Development Group LLC is seeking con conceptual review for a new building and parking lot within wetland setbacks as prop at property located at 29 Interstate Drive in the Industrial District Assessor's Map 58, Lot 6K, Site Number 12, 2023. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kevin McEnany uh, here uh, representing the applicant uh, via uh, uh, height engineering. Um, this is, uh, as you stated, a conceptual review uh, for a piece of property on 28 Interstate Drive that Favorite Development Group LLC owns. Um, they're requesting to build a 27,500 square foot building and associated parking of 30 spaces. Uh, the intent is for this building to house a meat process processing facility that currently is in Massachusetts, and they wish to relocate that up here to Summersworth. Um, they have another facility across the street, which is their main facility. That uh, building is not does not have sufficient space in it to house this this uh, meat packing or excuse me meat processing facility. They also own a building behind their main building. They have a tenant in a part of that, and they occupy a part of that. The only way that that could be reconfigured because of the way the angle of the building is built is to really take it down and rebuild, start from scratch. And um, the tenant in there currently has a five-year lease, so it gets complicated in those regards. Um, so in order to construct this building, uh, we'll be impacting the wetland buffers. Um, there's a breakdown on the plan of just how much wetland buffer both of building and parking and grading. Um, it totals 53,600 square feet of disturbance of the buffer. There's no wetland disturbance uh, asked, being asked for. Um, the, there's some constraints on the property that, that uh, kind of uh, require us to have the configuration that we have. Uh, first of all, the topo. So on the, the top part of the property, um, up where that bump out is, um, there's that's the higher part of the property and as you go down towards the, the larger wetland it drops off uh, pretty significantly in uh, in elevation which actually lends itself for the building and the loading dock to be at the lower level and the parking lot at the upper level in addition on that upper level there's a there's a an access easement for an abutting lot so we really could not put the building up there because there would not be enough room without encroaching onto that access easement. Um, you have in your package uh, a report from Mike Cuomo, the wetland scientist. Um, there's a, there are two wetlands on the, uh, associated with the property. One is a small sort of a round, if you will, uh, wetland that's maybe three quarters of the way back from the road. Um, that wetland is a man-made disturbance. It was an old borrow pit and it is subsequently turned into a wetland with wetland vegetation. Um, the larger wetland is pretty significant. Most of it is located on the abutting property, but it does affect a portion of this, and the buffers certainly do for sure. Um, the, if you look at Mr. Cuomo's report, um, he states there that the, uh, 
the wetland value of the smaller wetland is not as significant as the larger one um, for multiple reasons, one of which size alone and the other is because it was a man-made disturbance. Um, we, we intend to add a retaining wall around all of the property that's being, the area that's being developed in order to uh, ensure that we do not have any actual wetland disturbance and that it's just a buffer disturbance. Um, I guess what we're here to do, I mean, real, realistically, if you look at this property, um, it's almost undevelopable without some sort of buffer uh, disturbance. And I can tell you that um, um, Mr. Kelly uh, Petra is here this evening. He's with uh, Whole, Whole Foods. And uh, if you have any questions of him, he'd be happy to answer. When he first came to us, they were actually looking for a 50,000 square foot building because that's their needs. So we've kind of configured the, the building and, and chopped it down as much as we could, trying to fit with the configuration of the way the wetlands are and get a minimum amount of square footage that they could live with. So that's the, that's the design that we came up with. I guess at this point, we're just looking to get a sense from the <laughs> Conservation Commission. Um, we have not made any uh, formal applications, and we'd like to get a sense if you could support uh, these buffer impacts. We will be going to the Planning Board on a preliminary basis, uh, I think it's next week. So um, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the um, conceptual review. Uh, it's, it's better than going down the road with a lot of effort and then absolutely yeah um the first thing that i would point out is that it's not indicated on the plan but um there's an additional 50 feet uh setback from the 100 foot uh buffer that's no build which would put i free-handed it here but it would put the park the whole parking lot um within that zone as well as the buildings. The other thing that I would get, given that, I'm interested in uh, exploring further um, the value of the wetland and the placement. Um, the, the larger wetland that you refer to extends, well, at least the, the forest extends all the way into Rochester to the newly uh, conserved uh, New Hampshire Forest Society easement. Um, and I don't know if anybody's looked further than the, the plans, but there's a, a brook. Um, what's the name of the brook? Blackwater Brook um, that, that goes up there. Um, um, and we also had a, we had a, a fairly recent um, application for that uh, other building where the um, the lease is, right? Mm -hmm. Timber. Timber, so just, just to put this in so, you know, place in context. So I just want to speak to that. So we had looked at retrofitting uh, the existing building that we had there um, to get we, we went as far to get pricing and the square footage that we can get out of that building for a 10 or 15 year picture just didn't make sense for us financially or with that space. Um, we had also done conceptuals to that property to see if we can put a building of some type on that property with the existing building. Um, are any of you familiar with 20 Rescue Lane? It's the way he, the building was built originally, it's like at an angle, it's a square shaped parcel, but the building sits kind of across the property. So in conceptual, you could only get 15 to 17 in one area and then two like separated buildings potentially, but regardless, you would have to knock down 20 Rescue Lane. Um, we have future growth uh, with our main building. Eventually, we'd like to maybe 10 years down the road go into Rescue Lane with that building so we don't want to chew up a uh, parcel of land with the meat processing uh, company that we bought 10 years ago now, I'd say it was. Oh, could you just state your name again? I'm uh, sorry. Kelly Barstow. Kelly Barstow, thanks. 
So you bought this property 10 years ago or the other property 10 years this ago? This property that we're talking about right now, we bought with uh, 29 Rescue Lane, uh, 29 Interstate Drive. So that parcel was bought at the same time we bought that 20 five years ago, something like that. Don't hold me to that exactly. Okay. 20 Rescue Lane we purchased six or seven years ago. It went to auction, abutting property, uh, so we bought that at that time. Okay, so you've owned this for like about 20 years. At least 20 years. Okay, because I, I really, you're talking about putting, basically wiping out that whole buffer, both, both the zero to 50 and the 50 to 100, wiping out the whole buffer on that property. Um, and that's just as important as the wetland is. It keeps the wetland clean. It cle keeps allows the wetland to do its function, provides, um, you know, habitat for a lot of different species in an area of the state that really is losing its habitat phenomenally quickly. Um, so those things I have issues with. But then I also just practically, I don't see anything there about stormwater treatment from the runoff, for example. Um, and I know that you would do that more like once you actually get down to the plans, right. but you know, just as something to keep in mind that that's something else we'd be looking at. Mm -hmm. Mr. Degler, did you get a chance to look at the, uh, the wetland report? I did, yeah, the functions and values. Yeah, um, I'm unfamiliar with the ratings, the scale. Uh, the, uh, on one page it's called out um, We're looking at the uh, larger, smaller wetland. The larger. Um, these aren't paginated, but so there's a score for wetland flood index. Uh, and it shows the the ranges for um, low flood value, you know, up to high flood value, and seven to seven point six to ten is a uh, high flood value, and this falls into eight. Do you, do you know what the ranges are for the rest of the Criteria. You're talking about uh, flood storage. Um, what, what do you mean? Uh, flood storage. There's wetland-based recreation. I mean, there's not. No yeah. Um, so you're just wondering about the kind of range of values for other values, like right? Yeah. Because yeah, it's I, like zero to one for low flood value, one to two point five to low to moderate. 2.6 to 5 to moderate and 5.1 to 7.5 to moderate to high and they're just kind of just over into high flood value. So um, one of the other ones that I was particularly looking at was the uh, ecological integrity of 3.6. Do you know what that means? 3.6 integrity so yeah that's just the average value from uh, page one, um, it's <coughs> it's fairly low. I mean, that's going to be on a range out of ten as the maximum. So low, low, fairly low value. So Correct. Much. Okay. Yeah, for ecological integrity, just meaning that there's been, uh, you know, a lot of surrounding impacts, you know, in the in the general area. You know, so you know the things, you know, land use in the watershed. Uh, evidence of fill in the wetland, which there wasn't here. Um, you know, no agriculture activities. That was high scoring on this, but um, you know, a lot of human activity in the in the watershed. Um, not a lot of invasive species. A lot of uh, adjacent roads, driveways, railroad crossings within 500 feet of the wetland. There's going to be a lot of that, and that is a, a big degrader. Mm -hmm. um, same here, uh, a lot of human activity evident in more than 25% of the 500 foot zone of the entire wetland. And this is gonna be kind of just zooming out on the whole general wetland as well when he does this. Um, yeah, a lot of impervious area was a big one that knocked the score down here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fairly low for ecological integrity. So are all, are all these values Zero to ten. Yes. Okay. So groundwater 
for the, the larger wetland is 5.4. Sediment trapping is 9. Uh, nutrient removal, retention, and transformation is 9.4. See a breakdown to kind of in his discussion, um, it says like wetland FF1, the large one, um, does have notably high scores for nutrient removal, trapping and transformation, sediment trapping, and flood storage. And those are just going to be the high function areas. Um, and then intermediate scores for wildlife, groundwater recharge, and shoreline anchoring, and then low scores for ecological integrity, fish and aquatic habitat, scenic quality, education potential, and wetland-based recreation. And then, yeah, insufficient data for noteworthiness, but yeah, it's not particularly high, but it's not, it's not very low either. The FF2 one's much, much more degraded and you know especially it being a man-made wetland and, and isolated yeah there's really not much that wetland's going to be doing do you own any other property in the city uh no and i wanted to add that uh we came here we were about a 25 million dollar company we're 52 million now. Uh, the building, when we purchased it, we built an addition on that. That was a 10 year plan. We're capped on space where we are now. So if we can't figure out a way to build on our properties, we may have to go somewhere else. I mean, I don't want to. Uh, I live in Summersworth myself on Milo Lane. I moved here because my business was there, but uh, we, we looked into lease options with some of the places around here. The meat processing facility is a USDA inspected facility. It needs floor drains. It needs a cleaning system. It needs uh, certain types of refrigeration. Um, nothing about that facility is something you're going to go lease somewhere. You literally have to build it. Um, so in Summersworth, no. Um, we've looked at other options somewhere else, but it wouldn't be here. But that would mean the entire business. We can't. We're, we're trying to centralize the business, not keep it separate. Okay. The reason I asked is uh, to see whether you might be interested in um, mitigation by conserving land somewhere else in the city. Um. Currently, we don't. So, uh, Rescue Lane we own, 20 Rescue Lane. I don't know if that can happen on that parcel, but... Um, that's the only we own 20 rescue lane 28 interstate and 29 interstate 20 rescue lane that's that's close to it it abuts the property uh, 20 rescue lanes tax map 58 watt 6g what 20 rescues what you reviewed prior oh, and that's got the uh, existing commercial development on it yeah I thought I might have that. What's well, it correct me if I'm wrong but if you if you mitigate something in one area it doesn't have to be something that you currently own isn't it something that they could then buy and mit use that mitigation I, I believe so <clears throat> um, oh, it's, it's a little trickier I, I would say but oh. I mean, something has to be up for sale well, that's true. <laughs> is this asphalt drive on the, the north end? Is this existing? Is that kind of what? Yeah, which we own. It's a, there's an easement there. Okay. Uh, yes, it is asphalt. Broken up asphalt. It's not the greatest pavement at this point, but yes, it's an asphalt room. As far as we're talking on wetlands, is a man-made wetland uh, the same as an, any other wetland or basically where somebody dug a hole and it filled with water? 
Well, the ter terminology is just um, colloquial, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter, but the, it, it does give you some idea to look at the value of that particular wetland. You know, it's probably less of less value. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, it showed that it was. Yeah, that seems to typically be the case, especially in these borrow pit areas. What'll happen is they'll just take material out and, you know, just the water table seeps up and it's, you know, they're typically a lot less functional than a natural wetland. Um, but, you know, I, I have been surprised before, but, you know, looking through the, you know, the report, it does seem to be fairly low function and not really doing much. But, yeah, the southern ones seems to be a really good one. Or Western. Okay. Thank you. You know, in terms of permitting, et cetera, a wetland is a wetland, but. <clears throat> um, right, I'm just thinking about the impact on the wetland. Yeah. You know, from building, it seems like it would have less impact if it was something like this man-made quote wetland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. There is pretty substantial development on all three, well, three of these sides, just kind of surrounding this lot. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, the thing that you don't see on here is behind it. Uh, the, uh, the east side, where the, um, uh, where the brook is. So that's a fairly large area. Well, in, in terms of um, what we can offer you, I think we've mentioned, you know, we've several of us have hinted at the, the, belief, the belief that that smaller wetland, the isolated one, um, is of lesser value and um, having said that, it's probably something that we would be willing to work with um, it's high impact for sure um, you know everything is within the, the no build zone um, but you know if we were to <clears throat> if you were to come back and we were to hear another permit uh, application request That's something that would, you know, if you could move things away from the um, the larger wetland area, that's a, you know, that's a, a plus. Um, anything that you can do to um, limit impact on that wetland, uh, whether it's plantings or um, um, slope or um, paved areas, locations of paved areas. That would help your case. You had mentioned, um, I think at the beginning, Kevin, you, you mentioned going through, um, you know, different placements of the, of the building. Did you do something where you shifted, you know, sort of south, south? And on the site down, I know you were trying to buffer everything probably, but I'm just curious, does a building work if you moved a little bit south on the project? Which direction is south? It's, it's towards down. This, this yeah. way? Yeah, north is going up, up at an angle oh, from uh, you. That would, that would certainly impact that corn well. Mm -hmm. so. It would, but it would also be much further from the bigger wetland. Right. Right, yeah. Which is a higher value one? No, that would I, we. I don't see any. 
quick way. Um, we are trying to gain some parking. 29 uh, interstate, we're double parking at this point. Every single employee uh, had 30 employees. We have like 70 now, so we're trying to figure out how to gain some parking as well. So um, I don't know how we would work this into it, but I don't see any issue going that way. Yeah, I mean, if it, it sounds to me like the, the commission would prefer to have a wetland disturbance and reduce the buffer disturbance on the large wetland. Right. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Yeah, that would be overall yeah. lower impact. Yeah. yeah I think we I think what we tried to do is avoid any wetland impact. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that's why the retaining walls and all that, but if, if that's, you know, what you think is a better option, then we can certainly look at that for sure. Yeah, I anticipated this conversation, and I, I freehand it again, a, a line that goes that, uh, Takes the takes out of the takes the smaller wetland out of the picture, and basically, I don't, you you can look at this if you want. But um, this is orange line here, so um, that would be uh, 150 feet from the wetland. So it gives you a lot more wiggle room. Yeah, yeah I think your okay. initial thought to avoid wetland impact in general is almost always the right thing to do but mm -hmm. that little circular wetland it sounds like it has minimal value and from my perspective I'd rather see that wetland directly impacted if it spares buffer from yeah. the larger more functional one I was cool. gonna add to that too I, this is pretty full of invasive species as well the small mm -hmm. one okay all the more reason to tear it up then and, and having said that, when you if you do do something to the small wetland and it's full of invasive species, be aware you don't want to spread those invasive species anywhere else in the city. So it has to be or the state or the state anywhere else. So it's kind of like you got to store it on site away from the wetlands. Okay, very good. <laughs> don't want to spread it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of facing a, a unique situation here where this site is virtually all buffer land or wetland. There's not a lot you can do with it and have it be usable I at all. So we're kind of playing Tetris with this. That small wetland doesn't have a ton of value. Spare the buffer for the larger one to and sacrifice that. Um, try to reduce the impervious as much as you can, particularly in the wetland area. So on planning i think we'd be amenable to pushing paved area up to get your parking out of that buffer zone even if it does butt up against um a, a normal setback um there's not a lot you can do here but i think there's a few things you can do to minimize okay. maybe you can rotate the footprint of the building so yeah. so the other thing that i want to be clear uh, before we leave here there needs to be loading docks off of this end of right. the building. So how does that impact what they're suggesting? Well, I think that we, we would have to have like 130 feet. Right. Past it. I mean, it's a 53 foot trailer. There's no way to. I mean, it can be on this end of the building. And it's just tie up this way as we possibly can. Sure. I mean that has to that has to have yeah, that's floating docks. There's no the building doesn't function with that without yeah. those. So one of the pictures that um, was submitted did did seem to show that there were three loading docks at that end. Yeah, um, it's right here. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, they were on there. Sure yeah, dealing. yeah, that's not the building that we were just talking about. It was the 7,500 square foot building? Right, um, it's just the, east of that. The bump out on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't touch that. Yeah. 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 And uh, just kind of a, a function question here, without necessarily getting into the literally gory details. Uh, you're talking meat processing plant here. Is this a slaughterhouse on site, or are you nope. processing already? Primal. Got it. Primal okay. Space. Yeah. We we no no. I've gone to one in my life, and would never in my life go again. <laughs> yeah. Right there with you. Um, uh, I just wanted to make sure we weren't talking any kind of live animal storage here and the manure horrors that come with that. All right, thank you. Yeah, any any um, berms or, or anything you could do to um, 
separate the loading docks and, and the and the roadway from the wetland would be great. Okay, very good. I think we we have some direction. Uh, great. I'm glad we did this review because it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, yeah. 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 Saves a lot of energy. Okay, great. Are great. Thank well, you. thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have, thank you. have your night. Any other new business? I have something I could bring up in new business if you want. Sure. I have a list of things for you guys tonight. Um, so the walking trail bridges around Willen Pond have been um, identified that they need to be replaced. Um, and the condition of the bridges was not identified until after the budget was set. Um, so therefore there has been no money allocated within the city budget for this. So the question was raised that since the bridges are in connection with the conservation easement at this property, um, if Conservation Commission would support utilizing conservation funds for the project. We've reached out to um, NHMA and because it would be the footbridge would be help improve and facilitate utilization of the area around the conserva conservation easement you can use conservation funds for it um, public works has been looking into options for bridge replacements they're currently looking at aluminum um, bridge replacement um, since this would last longer than the current trex construction that's there um, which um, if they were to replace it in kind, it is Trex. Um, but to replace the two bridges, the current cost estimate that we've received is $60,000. They are soliciting an additional quote at this time still. Um, and they're also, staff is investigating any DES permits that are required, but ultimately, we wanted to bring it forward to the Conservation Commission to see if they would support utilizing any funds from the Conservation Fund for the project. Um, also, if they had thoughts on, if you all have thoughts on the aluminum bridge, or if you have a recommendation for a product that you thought would be better than aluminum bridge. Well, um, most of Will and Pond is owned by Dover. Understood. And um, so though the property is owned by the city of Dover, um, the, when the grant was received to establish the park, it was agreed upon at the time that Summersworth would be responsible for maintenance and repair of the trails. Anyone? Not um, any staff that is currently here. <laughs> because the only easements that Summersworth owns are those two slivers mm -hmm. near the gas station. Mm -hmm. What was the cost estimate for replacing in kind? Uh, I don't have that number with me, but it was less. But it's also that they've had to do repairs frequently over the years already do with the treks. Um, the treks would not be expected to last as long as an aluminum bridge. Sure, yeah. Um, so there would be the potential for having to continuously do it. It's the bridges are over standing water, et cetera. And if we didn't replace them? Um, would, I have some do? pictures if you would like to see the condition of them. I, I, I believe it. So part of the conservation easement that we do have says that, um, so the conservation easement that comes off of it used to be Agway. Um, must uh, now it must it's um, fiddleheads oh. and yes, thank you, Dale. <laughs> um, so they're a walking and non-motorized trail, um, and such use is for passage of pedestrian passage, non-motorized cycles, and wheelchair wheelchair access only. So I think that those bridges likely support those accesses but the conservation commission isn't the um, 
the authority for that easement. Understood. That would be Dover? Uh, if there is an easement, likely. They do own the property, yes. So I don't, given that, I, I, you know, since it's not a city easement, I would say it doesn't fall within our, our funds, okay. <laughs> to be frank. Um, it, it would, yeah. Just a couple of points to potentially raise here. Um, one is in terms of, of other materials. It sounds like the aluminum bridges are extremely expensive. I'm wondering if there might be a creative way to do this. The thing that springs to mind is there's um, snapped together but stable and secure plastic um, dock material that I've seen used for bridge, bridges before. Um, UNH uses that for their sailing club over on Mendham's Pond. That might be an alternate material that might come in a little bit cheaper than those aluminum bridges. Um, the other thing I'd raise is there's been a little bit of discussion on this commission about um, long-term funding viability, where our only funding source currently is uh, from land coming out of current use in the city or other similar easements. Um, and there isn't a lot of that left. Um, the commission may want to think about potential long-term funding sources, and this could be a good topic to uh, raise with the council, given this request from them. Another thought is that at least one of those bridges completely washed out in, in one of our floods. They're, they're not very well placed, and it may be throwing good money after bad to put another bridge there, as opposed to just sealing off the trail at that area. Um, just just thinking practically, um, you know, where we might be putting in a new bridge and then having to replace it 20 years down the road. Or sooner, yeah. And yeah, they're, they appear to, to me to be pretty sensitive wetland areas over there. That's one argument. Although they probably pre-existed, uh, did they pre-exist the agreement with Dover Bridges? Um, I don't know the exact history. I un understand that there was a grant received for the establishment of it, um, so there may be some ties to keeping it open, um, depending on the type of grant. Mm -hmm. um, but I do not know all of the details about the grant um, and the history of the project project okay. all right okay thank you what on that no. what else you got um go through my list you got mail oh <laughs> <laughs> um I am to share with you that our co-compliance officer, Shane, has been in touch with the Salmon Falls Nursery. Um, there are three trees that are they are, need to be replaced that are located um, along around Summersworth Plaza. Um, so they've looked at replacing those um, with two three-inch Shade Master locusts and two two-inch Donald Wyman crab apples. Um, so, and I have a couple of pictures of the dead trees, though you guys may have seen them as you come in. Um, but they are going to be, they're looking at replacing those with those trees. So. Um, a Shade Master locust and a Donald Wyman crab apples. Do we have uh, native locusts? Yeah. yeah. Has that been run by the urban forester? I don't know. I can ask. The placement of trees around parking lots is kind of tricky. Yeah. Our co-compliance officer does come from work within the state and has um, done a lot of agricultural inspections, but I can definitely check with him to see and Director Mears about talking to the urban forester. Okay. Um, yeah, if you look at uh, Idlehurst, um, the uh, urban forester came and looked, looked at that. And a lot of trees there 
just died, and uh, they just shouldn't have been where where they were put. Not enough, uh, you know, area for the the root base and mm -hmm. so forth. Yeah. Getting hit by plows. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have one more thing, if you'd like. Yeah. Um. So, um. Wild Birds Unlimited reached out to me the other day. They received, um, they saw the news blast oh, nice. that I sent out. Um, and they, so she sent an email and said that we'd love to come up with some ways that we can partner with the Summersworth Conservation Commission. We could do some feederscaping where we set up a pole systems and bird feeders and provide you with seed for those feeders. Even looking towards next spring, taking on a garden in the city with the same idea of setting up some feeders and planting, etc. We could also do a presentation at our store or other location on backyard bird feeding, saving the songbirds, certifying, certifying your yard, etc. So basically they're looking to do some sort of project with um, the city and the Conservation Commission. Um, That's great. I had put a bug in their ear a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, can you forward that email? Yes, I can. Definitely. Sure, please. Yep. Honey locust. Sorry? I was just looking up the Shade Master locust, and it's a um, type of honey locust, and those are not on our list of approved plantings. Yelled at enough developers wanting to put yeah. those into their plans to not do the same here. So we should kind of follow our own rules. Uh, AJ Dupree is the uh, enforcer. Dupair, sorry. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Rhodes, when you're ready, go to old business. Easement monitoring, I don't have anything. Anybody else? Okay. Item B, community wildlife habitat item for the city newsletter that got in there. Um, I also put in an item for invasives for um, specifically Bittersweet got into the last news newsletter. Although a lot of the content was missing still. So I'll have to figure out what happened there. Um, there was only one picture, and I think a picture is worth a thousand words, especially when you're trying to identify invasives. Okay. Um, so, but I'll, I'll do more of those. Uh, you know, I'll do um, not weed. Just go through the list. I've just been seeing so much bittersweet around the city. And we actually went to Buffalo to visit my son last weekend. You go down the highway, and everything is just smothered with bittersweet. You know, the trees are all dead. Um, uh, you know, pe people have it all over the yards, and they don't, you know, they don't realize what it's going to do. So anyway, um, that was the newsletter bit. Uh, next item is the invasives plan subcommittee report. Good segue. <laughs> I have no, okay. Item three, Mallee Farm Trail subcommittee report. Uh, do I have anything? Um, I did follow up with the consultants. They uh, saw no problem in having that report by the next meeting. Um, so I'll probably send them a message, you know, later this week or next week just to, you know, keep a bug in their ear. But hopefully I would get it maybe a week before the next meeting so um, we can all take a look at it. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Item four, exploration of formal conservation of Mallee Farm City Parcel. 
I think I emailed the lawyer and had him her back. I'll, I'll check. I have five tree, uh, city tree GPS and inventory project. Yeah, I con <clears throat> excuse me. I contacted uh, Mike Babinski regarding uh, determining right of ways and what trees fall within right of ways, and just told him what was going on. And he seems excited about the project. He uh, um, he did give me <clears throat> excuse me the name of Amber Hall at City Hall here to meet with. I've set up a meeting with her. I think it's next Tuesday at one o'clock, just to go over uh, how to determine where the right of ways are. He said to use the street maps, which I assume show the either from the curb line out or from the center line of the road out. So we should be able to determine what trees fall within that right of way. Um, like I say, I have a meeting with her at one o'clock. I think it's Tuesday. If anybody wants to be there, I don't think that. Any objection? I'm sorry? Yeah, one o'clock. Yep. Um, I also heard back from Jan uh, Jackson Rand from the SRPC, and he gave me the name of Gretchen Young, who apparently is the environmental project manager for the city of Dover. She was involved in the Tree Street project for them. And I've sent her an email to try to uh, set up a meeting to sit down and kind of discuss what they went through with the SRPC to get this up and running, what data they were looking at, how they did it. Uh, but again, I haven't heard back from her yet, but when I do, I can send something out. Um, I'm just wondering, did we have any actions coming out of the last meeting? You know, we, we had kind of a lengthy discussion about it. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss anything. I guess it was just exploratory. Unless anyone remembers anything to the contrary. All right. Um, Mr. Dodds, uh, there was a mention of, of Partnering up with Rollinsford on the trail? Yeah, um, I haven't done anything on that yet. I, I, I had originally, after the meeting, thought, yeah, you know, I should hold off on that. But I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe I should just try to reach out to, I don't track down their conservation commission or their rec person or something and at least make a contact. So um, I will do that before the next meeting. They have email, uh, an email contact on the web. For the commission. For commission. Yeah, okay. It goes right to the chairman. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, just remember that you know our last idea. I don't know what the um, consultant is, is going to tell us, but we we were talking about truncating the the trail before going to Rollinsford. So. Yeah. Correct. But the. The tie-in with the Rollins for, for trail would be up on, on the other side. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah, I think there was strong agreement to truncate the lower trail, and it, and it was a kind of a natural uh, stop point and everything. So, okay. All right. Uh, to follow up on. Some of my other commitments, um, I have not made contact with um, the state for the trail uh, at Ruel and Sunningdale. I think I emailed them as well. I'll have to double check on that too. Um, still have to go through the uh, easements that require signage. And I'm um, still on the hook for the uh, management plan for Lily Pond, that parcel.
Dana, was there any feedback from anyone on our feedback on the solar ordinance? We shared it at planning board. Jeremy did. Um, and I don't recall anything specific that came out of planning board um, discussion in regards to any of that. Okay. Where does it sit? Um, it's going back to planning week. board next week um, for further discussion. Um, whether I'm not sure if it's at a point yet where they are ready to recommend to council yet, um, but um, still in planning board. Okay. All right. Um, any other old business? Excellent. Is there a treasurer's report? There is. Our balance forward was $194,776.13. We received $859.43 in interest, as well as $60,000 from Terrascape Park LLC um, for 44-24 LUCT collected. No disbursements, and our ending balance was $255,635.56. Thank you. So that was the, the 60000 that they had referred to it was pending last time. Is that right? Most likely. From the current use yeah. version? Most likely. All right, thank you. Anything else? Anybody? Anything we missed? Motion. Make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right, there's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Meeting is adjourned at 733.